Truth be told, this is good enough to do 99% of the stuff that most people would do with things like YouTube. Hey guys, it's Derek and welcome back to my channel. If you happen to have one of these and you wanted to figure out what the best lens options are if you actually have like a mirrorless camera, especially when it comes to vlogging and making YouTube videos, keep watching. Now a lot of us when we make YouTube videos especially, we spend a lot of time doing stuff like this. We sit, we have the camera pointing towards us, we're reviewing products like cameras, phones and what have you, and what we have to figure out is the best lens to serve that purpose. Yes, it's important to get something that you can use as a multi-purpose lens, so when we do go out and shoot some landscape or some pictures of people, the lens still works well. But if our primary aim of using a lens is to do stuff like this where we're talking at the camera, what lens should we choose? Now this is going to be a really quick overview of what's the most important thing to consider when we get a lens, and that is the difference between full frame and crop sensor. Now basically that has a massive determinant of what lens you should get because you've got to understand these multiplications where if you have a crop sensor, you have to multiply the focal length of the lens you're currently using to make it an equivalent of a full frame. And that all sounds really complicated, but actually it isn't. So let me just give you the quick lens focal length 101 on this video and then I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about this Sony E-Series PZ 10-20 f4 G lens which is designed specifically for Sony mirrorless cameras which have a crop sensor. Now whilst in this video I will be talking mostly about Sony cameras it really doesn't matter what brand you have whether it's Sony, Canon, Nikon, Fuji, it doesn't matter, but the concepts are the same, except for one really small difference, which I'll explain in a second. This video is designed for people like us who do vlogs, where we point the camera at us, and we need to work out the right focal length for such a use, because what we don't want is we don't want to have a lens which is not suitable for purpose. And when it comes to doing vlogs like this, the very specific lens we need to use is somewhere around about the 16 to 20 millimeter mark, because it allows us to get fairly close but you have some background behind us. We don't want lenses which are so tight where this is what happens and this is not what your audience will want to see. They actually want to see not only you, but sometimes what's going on behind you. Now this thing here, this is a beast. This is a Canon. It's an L series, so it's kind of like the professional. It's a 16 to 35 full frame lens. It's got a maximum aperture of f2.8. So this is a lens that a lot of travel photographers will use and a lot of wedding photographers when they want wide angle portraiture. At its widest end, the 16 millimeters, that's plenty good for doing stuff like this. 35 millimeters is kind of like a good walk around street lens, which is really versatile. And at a maximum aperture of f2.8, it allows us to really blur out the background. Although in a case of a wide angle lens, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. When we're talking about telephoto lenses, anything 50, 100, 200, 300, the amount of separation you can get from the subject and the background and what's called the bokeh, which is the little round circles you get, which is the stuff behind you that's out of focus, becomes a talking point in photography. So 2.8 is not really a huge deal when it comes to wide angle, but it certainly is if you're talking about portrait lenses. The 16 to 35 f 2.8 L lens for a full frame Canon camera is expensive, it's heavy, and it's big. And when you mount this beast onto a body and you have to hold it like that, for an extended period of time when you vlog, it's not very nice. So here we are looking for a cheaper, lighter, more versatile lens, which is good for the stuff that we're talking about in this video. And what are the options? The options are we get a prime or a fixed lens, which is only has a definite one setting, one focal length, and which is great because usually the quality of the images that come out of these lenses are superb, but it lacks a little bit of versatility because there's only one focal length. So you can't zoom, and the only way you can zoom is actually use your feet and walk closer to the subject or further away from the subject. Now with different brands of cameras, there's slight variations of the zooms that we're gonna talk about next, but they're all pretty much the same, except for the difference that we have to talk about, which is once again, the difference between full frame and crop sensor. This lens belongs to a full frame camera. The lens on this Sony FX30 belongs on a crop sensor. Now I'm only going to talk about Sony lenses from now on and this one in particular because this is the lens I own but as I mentioned earlier the principle is the same. When you look at a lens which is full frame 16 to 35 means 16 to 35. With a crop sensor lens it depends on the type of lens you use. This lens is designed specifically for Sony crop sensor which is called APS-C bodies and this one happens to have a focal length of 10 to 20 millimeters. Now yes it's 10 to 20 millimeters, 
but it's not the equivalent of the 10 to 20 millimeters in this full frame lens format. Because it's a crop sensor with Sony, you have to multiply the focal length of a crop sensor lens by 1.5 times. And with some of the other brands like Canon and Nikon, you may have to multiply it by 1.6 times. So a 10 to 20 in full frame terms is the equivalent to a 15 to 30. So roughly the same as this lens. Now this one obviously is not an f2.8, it's an f4. But in terms of focal length, these two are very similar and very comparable in terms of this discussion. So basically, anything which has a crop sensor, an APS-C sensor, if you have a Sony, you have to multiply the focal length of a crop sensor or an APS-C lens by 1.5 times to achieve the full frame equivalent. There's one thing that makes it even more complicated. It is possible to put full frame lenses, even this one with an adapter, but you can definitely get the Sony equivalent, the Sony 16 to 35 f2.8, a full frame. So Instead of saying E on here, it'll say FE. You can put that on to this camera, which is a crop sensor camera. But the 16 to 35, as a full frame, you also have to multiply by 1.5 to get the equivalent. So if you stick a 16 to 35 full frame lens on this, it's going to be 24 to like 52. So that's as complicated as it gets. You just got to remember that for a full frame camera, you want to get about 16 to 20 millimeters to do videos like the ones we're doing now. And for a crop sensor, you want the equivalent of 16 to 20, which is around about 10 to 15 millimeters if you're using a APS-C lens. So with that out of the way, the difference between these two lenses, which have reasonably the same purpose when it comes to just doing YouTube videos like this, is that this one is heavy, this one is big, this one's really expensive. This goes approximately about two and a half, three thousand dollars and no matter what camera brand you get the prices are roughly the same. This lens on the other hand goes for a thousand dollars. So it's already kind of two and a half times more expensive to get a full frame equivalent. Yes it only shoots at f4 rather than f2.8 as its maximum aperture but it doesn't make a huge amount of difference when it comes to making videos like this one. So we're satisfying a lot of our needs as a YouTuber, and that is we've got a versatile, so it zooms a little bit, so it's got a two times zoom basically, so it goes 15 millimeters up to 30. It is lighter, and it's relatively more affordable than one of the bigger lenses. And that, for a lot of people, is one of the criteria for purchasing any piece of photographic equipment, especially when we're starting out when we don't need the really professional stuff. The camera that I'm using right now to actually film this video is actually a Nikon Z30. So the lens I'm using on this Nikon Z30 right now is a 16 to 50 f 3.5 to 6.3 kit lens. 16 to 50 is the equivalent, I think it's 1.6 times for a Nikon, but you roughly get it as about a 25 to about a 75 or so millimeter lens. So just call it 24 to 70, which is the standard kind of versatile zoom lens that you get for full frame. It is 3.5 to 6.3 maximum aperture. So the f6.3 is pretty rubbish and it's not great for portraits, but that's not what this lens is designed for. In particular, it's a versatile, it's a kit lens, which is cheap, but it does the job. And this is at its widest setting. So this is at 16, which I said is a approximately 24. So if I hand hold it, my hands outstretched, you can still well see the stuff that's going on behind me and it's not too heavy and I'm pretty sure that I can carry this around for most of the day without feeling like my arm's going to fall off. So if I zoom in a little bit, so if I, as I move in, as, as I zoom closer, we get to the tightest end, which is the 50, which is the equivalent of roughly a 75 millimeter lens. And you can see this is not practical for using for this purpose. I'm holding it at arm's length and this is all you can see. So as I back off, you will see that more of me comes into the frame and you can start seeing the stuff behind me. And as I zoom all the way back, there it is at the equivalent of a 16 to 50, which is 16 times eight. It's about a 24 millimeter lens, which is probably as narrow as you want to get for doing stuff like vlogging like this. The other important thing to consider is that this body, the Nikon Z30, has no in-body image stabilization. So all or any image stabilization is provided by the lens. And that's really important because when you're walking around vlogging, you're going to be bouncing up and down. And if you don't have any image stabilization of any sort, your video is going to be really shaky. And yes, you can try and correct that in post using one of the video editing things, but why not try to get the best of both worlds and make it easier for yourself? 
by getting some sort of image stabilization on your equipment. So a lot of the APS-C Sony bodies do not have in-body image stabilization. This one does. And the benefit of that is, again, Sony uses Active Shot, which is the same as the Nikon VR, pretty much. So in terms of using this lens on this body, which is the FX30, the lack of image stabilization on this lens itself is not a huge deal because there's in-body image stabilization in this camera. But if you're using one of the A-series, not the top of the range, but some of the early ones like the A6000, which does not have inbuilt in-body image stabilization, you're gonna find it really hard to get stable images when you're walking around vlogging like people do. You know, when they're doing travel vlogs, when they're walking around just talking to the camera, holding it at arm's length. So 10 to 20, equivalent to 1530 on a Sony APS-C body. Light, versatile, not too expensive, good image quality. It's pretty much what you wanna get when you wanna do videos like this. And for those of you who are interested, this particular lens has a 62 millimeter diameter. So if you're gonna put a UV filter on it or any ND filters or polarizing filters, and you'll see that I've made a previous video about why it's important to me to have a UV filter on all my lenses, you're just gonna to have to pick the one that's 62 millimeters. Is this a perfect travel kit if you're doing a combination of vlogging, scenery, and portraits? Probably not. If I was to take this camera overseas or on a big trip where I would do some vlogging like I would anyway, but if I had some plans of doing some portraiture or if I wanted to take some pictures of wildlife or something like that, I would definitely consider bringing a second lens along because this lens is not long enough to cover the telephoto range of any of the photos or video that you want to capture. And something like maybe the 18 to 105, which is stabilized by the way, so if you have a non-stabilized body, that would be a good choice. So something like an 18 to 105, which is going to be the equivalent of a 27 to 150, and it comes as f4 as well, that would be a good accompaniment to this lens if you're looking for a kit which is a little bit more versatile and if you want to shoot not only vlogs like like this but you want to document other stuff as I said if you want to take portraits or wildlife or birds or other bits of scenery that might be a good accompanying lens for this one with this APS-C type body. So I hope you found this video of some use to you so basically just to sum up if you're a vlogger and you want to make stuff for YouTube and other social media getting a right lens for a camera like this is going to help improve your workflow and make things a lot easier. Yes, you can do anything you probably need to do in terms of YouTube on one of these. But if you want to use one of these, something around a 16 to 35 full frame equivalent is probably the ideal lens for you. You don't need f2.8 when you're doing stuff like this. All it does is make it heavier, bigger and more expensive. If you're after a lens which is a little bit more versatile, and you want to take some portraits because at 35 millimeters maximum you're not going to get a great portrait because it distorts the face what you want to do with portraits is the longer the lens the better the portraits are going to take and if you get a fast which is a wide aperture lens and you open it right up at like 100 millimeters or above you're going to get much better separation and blurring in the background which is what you want for portraits if you want that you probably need to add a second lens to the arsenal. But as a general walk around lens where you're just gonna do stuff like this, I highly recommend a 16 to 35-ish type of lens. And this 10 to 20 F4 is perfect for the purpose of my YouTube videos. So hopefully you found this video useful in explaining some of the focal length issues and the differences between using a full frame lens on a full frame camera versus using a full frame lens on a APS-C camera and an APS-C lens on an APS-C camera. Everything seems to be interchangeable, but for most situations, yes, you can use a full frame lens on a crop sensor body. You cannot use a crop sensor lens on a full frame body because the lens does not cover the entire sensor and you're gonna get vignetting, which means the periphery of the image is gonna have nothing in it. The only thing that changes this scenario is the fact that some of the Sony's, I don't know if any of the other makers do this, they have an APS-C setting on their full frame cameras which converts it to an equivalent of a crop sensor body. But if your camera body does not have this, do not get crop sensor or APS-C lenses for your full frame camera because they won't work. For those of you who think that at some point you may upgrade from an APS-C body to a full frame, yes there's an argument to get full frame lenses, but you just got to remember the trade-off, the fact that they're heavier, they're bigger and they're more expensive. And you do have to increase the focal range measurement of the full frame lens by either 1.5 or 1.6 times, depending on the brand. So don't be fooled that a 16 to 35, which is a great lens for full frame body, is gonna serve you the same purpose on a crop sensor body.
because it's not. So I hope that wasn't too confusing, but if there are any questions, please leave them in the comment below and I'll do my best to answer them. And in the meantime, I just want you to go out, enjoy shooting with whatever pieces of equipment you have. And remember, it's all about creating the art, not worrying about the gear so much. Until next time, remember to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time in another video. Bye.